In this lecture, I'll discuss symbolic and interpretive anthropology. So uh, what I'm going to go through is an overview of symbolic anthropology, give you guys some of the main ideas in symbolic anthropology, the main schools of thought, and what it contributed to the discipline as a whole. I'll also be looking at some of the critics of symbolic anthropology. From there, I'll go into a discussion of the work of Mary Douglas, uh, who McGee and Worms believe does the best job of integrating um, some of the critiques into her work overall. Uh, talk about earlier work by Victor Turner and the influence, uh, which was really quite a uh, happenstance that he came across Van Gennep's work on rites of passage, uh, the notion of liminality, and incorporates that into his later analyses as well. Uh, and then from there, move um, to American anthropologist Clifford Geertz. So uh, overall, symbolic anthropology uh, was at its peak in the 1960s and 70s. Its uh, major ideas was um, it really called into question the idea that cultural anthropology was or even should be a scientific enterprise. Uh, the symbolic anthropologists maintain that culture does not exist apart from individuals, but rather lies in their interpretations of events and things around them. The belief in general is that we construct our own cultural reality. The patterns of their behaviors uh, uh, essentially uh, gives meanings to the experience. Uh, the, and uh, this is what they were interested in overall. The overall goal was to analyze how people give meanings to the reality and how this reality is expressed in cultural symbols. In essence, how people formulated their reality. The symbolic anthropologists treated culture as mental phenomena. They rejected the notion that culture could be modeled like mathematics or logic. So an explicit uh, rejection of cognitive anthropologists as well as ethnoscientists. Although they were certainly influenced by ethnoscientific studies, uh, which in turn were also influenced, as we discussed before, uh, by both linguistics and superior of hypotheses. The tools for symbolic anthropologists included a variety of analytical tools from psychology to history uh, to literature to the study of symbolic action within culture. Some of the critics of symbolic and interpretive anthropology maintain that there was a lack of objective method. Well, this isn't really surprising since what the critique of the symbolic and interpretive anthropologist was, uh, was going towards a re-evaluation of the scientific enterprise as a whole within cultural anthropology. Um, Nevertheless, the critique maintains that the lack of objective methods, which seems to allow uh, analysts to see meaning wherever and however they wish. So here's the issue with interpretive anthropology, the idea of, well, whose interpretation is it? How do we see meaning? How is this interpreted in a particular context? And again, if you remember, this was some of the same critiques that the ethnoscientists raised concerning uh, the work of Levi Strauss and other individuals. Well, and, and actually that, that, that critique could be extended um, in a variety of contexts text with ethnoscientists and cognitive anthropologists consider, uh, who critiqued uh, the human relation area files of uh, Murdoch, uh, the idea that certain categories should necessarily fit across the board in all human experiences. Uh, the critics also maintain that it was primarily descriptive and it did not lend itself to general theoretical and methodological formulations. And again, this becomes one of the uh, major uh, concerns here in building a scientific enterprise in cultural anthropology and a positive stance overall is how, how does one build the discipline over time? Uh, how are case studies potentially scaled up to talk uh, uh, and make broader uh, generalizations about humanity as a whole, and really the question here is should they be? Uh, much of what symbolic anthropologists know is derived from the imaginative insight into particular cultures or events within the cultures, hence their knowledge does not provide a theoretical basis for understanding culture as a universal phenomenon. Also, in terms of style and potentially uh, disciplinary marking here, uh, individuals that were critiquing symbolic and interpretive anthropology were saying, well, you know, maybe this isn't really anthropology after all. Maybe this is more along the lines of literary criticism. Uh, and so even in, in the context of things like writing styles and uh, sty uh, particular aesthetics of theoretical text or what constitutes anthropology here is called into question, which of course uh, we, we see with a number of different turns 
uh, theoretical turns within anthropology that challenge pre-existing uh, norms and standards for what the dis what actually constitutes the discipline. And of course, this process is still happening today in terms of uh, how individuals are marking what exactly should be. Uh, you know, from everything from how programs are structured at both the undergraduate and graduate level to the content of particular courses to what should be emphasized or not. Uh, and then to um, looking at dissertations and, and you know, asking questions and books and saying, well, is this really anthropology or uh, how does this fit into other disciplines? Uh, and what really is anthropology in relation to these other disciplines today? So the impact, though, of the symbolic and interpretive anthropologist is that it forced anthropologists to become aware of cultural texts that they interpret and of ethnographic texts that they create. That these ethnographic texts do not stand apart, that they do not represent some objective reality. Uh, and again, we see some of this critique from the earlier work, um, looking at this from uh, the, the, the critique from a gender perspective, uh, from a number of different theoretical perspectives. In order to work as intercultural translators, anthropologists need to be aware of their own cultural uh, uh, basis uh, and biases as well as other cultures that they research. Uh, and overall, this leads to some of the reflexive turn within anthropology, um, asking questions about our own discipline, how do we know things? And th again, this is some of the critique that comes out with anthropology and gender in the context of postmodernism as well. Uh, one of the foremost scholars, according to Mickey and Worms, in this school of thought is Mary Douglas. Uh, she was um, initially went to school at a covenant in Roehampton. She uh, took British uh, colonial office until 1947. Her field work was in the Belgian Congo, um, and uh, 19, where she produced a, a dissertation in 1950. She was at University College in London for 25 years, uh, from 1977 to 81, she was at the Foundation for Research, uh, Foundation Research Professor of the Cultural Studies at the Russell Sage Institute, and at Northwestern University um, as an Avalon Professor of Humanities. She was influenced by both Durkheim and Evans Pritchard. Uh, Durkheim's uh, notion of um, to try to separate sociology from psychology. Again, we're talking about disciplinary boundaries here. Uh, what marks or distinguishes so the sociological approach overall? Uh, and again, we see some of this tension with the different theoretical schools in anthropology. Uh, are we doing more psychology here? Are we getting away from uh, the core of what anthropology should be when we write uh, literary pieces as the critique of symbolic anthropologists, uh, interpretive anthropologists came about? Uh, Durkheim noted that rules of ritual and pollution uh, are called social facts, uh, reflect the ways that society maintains its structure and solidarity, and that ritual is essentially an attempt to create and maintain a particular culture. Of course, we can see some of this in the context of uh, Max Gluckman in, in the context of uh, ceremonial conflict as well to reinforce the social order. E. Evans Pritchard's work as well was influential and uh, helped in certainly formulate um, many of Mary Douglas's um, thoughts that came. Uh, in probably her seminal work, uh, Purity in Danger, 1966, um, which you have an excerpt from in the book here, uh, there's a discussion of universal patterns of purity and pollution uh, symbolism that exist and are based on reference to the human body. Overall, uh, Mary Douglas argues her case from the Durkheimian perspective, suggesting that shared symbols create a unity and experience, and that religious ideas about purity and pollution symbolize beliefs about the social order. Uh, again, so shared symbols and uh, impurity and danger uh, promote social solidarity and mechanisms for social control. She crit criticizes earlier work, a psychoanalytical approach, and bodily substances are symbols of danger of power because they symbolize relations within society as a whole. That is, they're not just bodily substances, but they speak to a larger context within society as a whole. In uh, her other major work, Natural Symbols, in 1970, uh, she lays out a, a grid uh, group or group grid framework that all societies can comp be compared by two cultural dimensions. Uh, the group is the degree of division between insiders and outside of society, outsiders in a particular society, whereas the grid refers to the rules that relate individuals to one another. Douglas classified different societies based on her grid and group categories. Then she linked these two variables uh, to other dimensions uh, of culture, such as economic and political aspects.